What is the reasonable warrant for accepting that there's a God at all? Okay, let me try to answer that. Um, I start with the fact that here we are flung into the world with no clear understanding of A, where the universe came from, not the earth, but the universe, B, why we're here and what the purpose of our life is, and C, what if anything happens to us after we die. I would argue that, so we are in a very peculiar position where human beings were flung into the world and the three of the most important questions we could possibly ask, we have no answer to. Now, now I'm going to agree on. with you. You do agree or you not, not agree? I'm going to agree with you on two of the three. The middle one on purpose, I think, assumes there's a purpose that has, there's, there's been no demonstration there's a purpose to it. What, if any, purpose we have for sure. our life? Okay, so now we are in agreement that on the three cardinal questions, we are in a certain kind of blindness. We're in a certain kind of blind ignorance because we don't know, correct? So I, I don't, so if we start, it, you're saying we're flung into this universe without an understanding of the origin of the universe, the purpose of life, or what the, happens afterwards. Right, where the universe came from, yes. who, if anyone, or sure. what made it, if anyone, B, what the purpose of our life is, if any, and C, what if anything happens to us after we die. We are in violent agreement right now. Perfect. Now the second question arises, what does science have to say about these three questions? Can science either now, and if it can't now, settle these matters in the future? Let's look at them one by one. Let's take them in reverse order. Sure. Can science decide the matter of whether or not there is life after death, yes or no? Uh, it, it depends. Depends on what? So science only deals with uh, the natural world. Correct. And so if in fact there's a supernatural existence after this, then it may forever be beyond the purview of science. Correct. Or if there is another universe that operates according to different laws and we happen to move somehow into that universe, science would have nothing to say about it, correct? No, because not necessarily, because, because okay. if, it's a, if it's a natural, you know, like we have like hypotheses about a multiverse or whatever. Correct. I can't say what science will be able to test for in the future or whether or not there, we are permanently confined to the cosmos that we experience. I can't say. I can't even rule out, I can't say that science could never say anything about the supernatural. All I can say is that as it stands right now, I'm unaware of any supernatural claim that has any evidence for it that science could evaluate to determine that it was true. So, right, let's put it a little differently because, because we, I don't want to debate the detail here. I just want to look at the macro picture. And what I'm basically saying is Shakespeare said, I think correctly, death is the undiscovered country. No one has been to the other side of the curtain and, and essentially reported, given us empirical evidence one way or the other, correct? We well, don't know what happens I after that. So, so here's the thing, and I promise I'm not being difficult. This is just, just for clarity. Um, as a skeptic, my position is not, you know, like when the... the, the psychics who claim that they're speaking with the dead. Right. Um, my position is not, they're wrong and that's bullshit. My position is, they cannot demonstrate that what they're actually doing is what they claim. And so I can't say, nobody's been to the other side and communicated back. I can just say there's no reliable evidence for it, and I don't know what shape that evidence would take in order to demonstrate that. Okay, I want to come back to that, because that you've now made to me a very striking claim, namely that we should, I think you're saying, disbelieve all claims for which there is not sufficient evidence. So, not, I, not just that we should take an agnostic position, but we should disbelieve them. That's two different uh, things. Oh, so if you mean disbelieve as in believe they are not true, that's the exact opposite of what I just said. Okay. What I said was we should believe things when there's evidence for it, and that is both the proposition that the supernatural is real and the proposition that the supernatural is not real. Okay. You can call, so agnosticism isn't some middle ground between believing X and believing not X. There is no middle ground. You are either convinced of X or you are not convinced of X. And I'm, I'm not convinced that the supernatural is real. That doesn't mean that I'm convinced that the supernatural isn't real. It's kind of like if you go into a courtroom, okay. I, can, I, I may have to say not guilty even if I'm not convinced of innocence, because the burden of proof is on the claim of guilt. And so the people who say, I have good evidential warrant to believe in the supernatural, have adopted a burden of proof, and they have to meet it. And until they do, I am not convinced. 
Okay, but let's, we'll come, let's be clear about what that burden of proof is, because I'm not saying I have definitive proof that God exists, or these are his attributes. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, I don't know if there is a God in the sense of no. I call myself a believer. Now, right away, we distinguish between a believer and a knower, right? Sure. It's an important distinction. Of belief. I believe there is a place called Papua New Guinea, because I trust maps, and I've studied about it. Uh, and, uh, but I know my brother. I wouldn't say I believe I have a brother because I know the guy. So knowledge... Are you saying you don't know that there's a Papua on a Guinea? No, I'm saying, I'm saying I, I, I know it in the sense that I accept the authorities from which I learn about it. Sure. I, I trust it. Well, and if for, I for went clarity, there... It's not just relying on authority. It's, it's actual evidence. So you have a belief in a proposition. Right. Whether or not it qualifies as knowledge is a separate question because knowledge is a subset of belief. In philosophy, it would be justified true belief. I tend to use a more kind of colloquial because I'm a dilettante. I'm an uneducated oaf who just talks a lot. But if you have a proposition and you accept that it's true, that's all I mean when I say I believe it. You either accept it or you don't. If I say I know it, all we generally mean, all most people mean when they say I know something, is that they really, 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 really believe it. They're talking about the confidence level that they have in that proposition, that it is likely true. And when we say I know something, generally we're saying I believe this to the extent that it would be worldview altering to discover it was wrong. And so I believe there's a Papua New Guinea. I would actually argue that I know, I have evidential warrant that there's a Papua New Guinea without actually, without actually ever having been there. This is, you know, people used to do the, uh, oh, well, you, you don't know there's an Australia. Well, I do now because I've been there. But even before I was there, I think that I had evidentiary warrant for it. Yeah, but, but okay, I agree with that. I, and I know that there's a Papua Guinea in that sense. Let's sure. take a different example. If, let's say I were to tell you I'm from India. Okay. okay. You have no reason to doubt me. You probably believe I'm from India. Yeah. Now, you don't actually know that. It depends on what you mean by no. Well, and, and are you 100% sure? No. Do, is 100% certainty required for knowledge? Not necessarily, but I would, what's, I would what's agree. your bar? I have, so I don't think you can be 100% certain about anything, okay. which is why I abandon the notion of certainty, which is why when I talk about knowledge, um, I talk about it as a subset of belief and it is a confidence level. But also, I genuinely don't really, I, I'm unimpressed when someone says they know something because we don't wait till we have knowledge to act. We act in accordance with our beliefs and whether or not your belief rises to the no level of knowledge doesn't change what, you're gonna, what okay. your action's gonna be. All right, so let's, let's, let's sort of circle back to where I was going okay. with the three big questions. And I think you- We started with death. Were in, right, you were in violent agreement that the cause, that right, that we don't know, the cause of the universe, you don't, we don't know, any prescribed purpose for our lives. We try to discover it, but we don't know it. Um, and uh, we don't know what happens after death. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced that anything does, but I definitely well, uh, would agree, we don't know. Fair enough. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you do about belief when you are in exactly this position? When, if something is true, it would have tremendous implications. For example, you would concede that if there was life after death, that would greatly affect the way we think about life on Earth now. It, it would. Depending on what that life looked like. And depending on whether or not anything in this life had any impact on that life. Correct. But, yeah. but, but right. yes. So, so let's just say if the religious narratives are correct and there is some sort of cosmic justice in which, let's just say, the, the crimes that are the undiscovered crimes of this life have to be accounted for in a future life we would probably have to start thinking about all the stuff that we get away with in private because even though we escape human accounting, there would be some sort of presumably divine accounting. So in other words, all I'm trying to establish is that there's a relevance to these questions even if we don't definitively know anything about them, anything about the answer. The answer matters which way we go. I, would, I agree the answer matters. It's just that the answer right now is I don't know and you can play the what if game for any one of them. What if there's nothing? What if it's the end? What if there's a being who's going to judge you based on whether or not you fell for things without sufficient evidence? What if so, that's the criteria? Okay, so what, you seem to, so what you seem to say is I think about something and if I really can't answer the question, right, I take the default position that that something doesn't exist until evidence shows up that's going to convince me it does. Of course. That's, That's your view. That is sound epistemology that accepting... Sound epistemology according accepting, to whom? Uh, 
according uh, to you. Sure. Okay. We'll just go according to me because I don't need to cite anybody else. Right. Because I'm right. Because. <laughs> the, okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let's 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 see if you're right. Yours, let's see if you're right. The alternative would be to to say that I'm justified in believing something before there's sufficient evidence for it. But I would argue that you do that every day. Let me let's give me give you a cardinal example. But but that oh. doesn't change the fact whether I should. You the should. I know. I'm, I'm saying you. We're do all going to make mistakes. You, you do and you should. Look. Our life is always lived in anticipation of an unknown future, right? You're dating a woman. Yes. And, um, and so what you do is you, being a very reasonable guy, plug in all this data, mm -hmm. right, uh, about this woman, and you're trying to make a rational decision, let's say, is this the woman I want to spend my life with? Let's assume you're thinking about that question. For the sake of your argument, we'll assume I'm thinking about that. Okay. Now, I would argue that, in reality, given the way human beings are, you could never really know what life with this person is going to be like, let's just say, over the next 30 years. First of all, you'll be different people in 10 years, or different people in 30 years. So this question about what it's going to be like is unanswerable with any high degree of, of certainty. Correct? Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I, unlike many religions, actually support the notion of divorce and, and I'm opposed to the notion that there's a soulmate out there that you're going to be everything to forever. If we're both in agreement that we don't know what the future holds, I don't make a decision but to say... But if you'll pardon me, that's, that's a tediously predictable response. I'm not going there. Where I'm going with, with well, is I the fact... Well, I didn't think you were going there. No, because... There. Right. Where I'm really going with is the fact that in making a decision of whether or not to be with this person, yes or no, mm -hmm. you are necessarily taking a huge leap of faith. No. 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 See, that's the thing. My, the way I operate my life, and maybe I'm a weirdo, is, so for example, in this case, I have no plans to end this relationship, and neither does she, but we are both adults, and we, as and my, my one, there were two rules, be honest, have fun. That's it. That's all. Be honest, enjoy life. And as long as we're both honest, we can reevaluate the nature of our relationship at any point. I am friends with every one of my exes, including my ex-wife, who I just spoke to. We went into it with this optimism that perhaps we would spend the rest of our lives together and with the realistic notion that it doesn't happen. Anybody who, th the divorce rate's 50 some odd percent, anybody who goes into a marriage now thinking, ah, oh, we're never gonna get divorced, is already in opposition with the actual data. And so I, as a huge proponent of David Hume, one of my favorite quotes from him, is that the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. So my confidence in any proposition, including this particular relationship lasting until I die, is based on whatever data I have. I don't have some delusion uh, that some other people want to run around with. I, I've, I've found the person and we're definitely going to be together forever because life is uncertain. And it seems that rather than engaging in that self-deception, I'm fine saying, this is what I hope happens. I hope that I am with you for the rest of my life. I hope that or for the rest of our lives or whatever. But I don't have an unrealistic expectation. But don't you make plans? Sure, I make plans for tomorrow because that's the pragmatic... You don't you buy know, insurance, you don't build homes, you don't make plans, you don't, yeah. you don't put money into a 401k, and you don't, you don't put money into educational funds. Yes. You do. Right. So in other words... That's because I have a reasonable confidence based on data about how long I'm likely to live and what benefits are likely to, to be rewarded from there. Based it's on not an exercise so it, of faith. Let me ask you this. Because the, what you're talking about is confidence in the absence of certainty. But I'm, my confidence is proportional to the evidence. The fact that there isn't certainty about the future doesn't mean that it's an exercise of faith. I'm saying that the evidence you're invoking is bogus because according to you, if the divorce rate were 5%, you would make lifetime plans because according to you, there's a much higher chance, 95% probability. No, that's not remotely what I said. Well, I it would, is kind of I what you said. I would make lifetime plans because I hope to have a lifetime. Not because what the divorce rate is. Well. I, I know what the life expectancy is for people in the United States, for me roughly, I can, I can make a rough guess as to barring some other consequences, how long I'm gonna live. So of course I'm gonna plan for the future. You plan for what you are optimistically hoping for, but I could get hit by a bus out here in New York where, by the way, the, no, it doesn't matter which direction you're walking down these streets, the wind is always in your face. <laughs> Sorry. That, is, that may be true. Look, um, I think life 
is lived in the moment, we look at memory as a reliable, although not very reliable, yeah. account of the past, but we trust it. Even though, again, if someone were to demand we substantiate that trust, we'd be a little hard-pressed to do it. it would be memory is very selective. Other people remember different things than you remember and so on. And life is, is, has an unknown future stretching in front of us. Now, at all times in history, people are in huge ignorance about the world, large parts of which in the past were completely unknown. If I was Socrates walking in, the, in Athens in the 5th century BC, and I looked up in the sky, I'd see seven stars, right? Now, if I was taking the rationalist position, I would say, well, I see seven stars. I have no reason to believe that there are any more stars in the sky. And hey, it, just for clarity, yes. are you saying this is remotely accurate or is this just an example? Because anybody who thinks that back then people only saw seven stars, I got problems with. No, fair enough, okay. fair enough. I, I'm, using, I'm using the okay. limited radius of our empirical knowledge. Just, I knew that. Just for your benefit, it's an analogy. Yeah, right. You got and, and, you know, the, uh, yeah, so the ancients knew the earth is round and so on. But, but the, true, the point here is that you have this limited body of data. But if you really reflect on the data and you also reflect on yourself, right away you see, hey, I'm Socrates. I've never moved five miles away from the place I was born. I don't even know how big the Earth is. There could very well be a whole bunch of other stars out there, and just because I have not one ounce of empirical evidence for them, I can't be close to them or declare them out of bounds or declare that my whole life has to be lived without regard to that possibility. Well, because not, it's a very real possibility. So let's say you and I both lived on, on this particular plot of land in New York our entire lives, and we had only ever seen seven stars. Right. I'm not ruling out the possibility that there are other, seven other stars. I'm right. dealing with people who are saying there are more than seven stars, and they can provide no evidence for it. Right. But let's, let's just say that those people who say that there are more than seven stars, right, have the following type of reason for, those, for saying that. They say, first of all, let's just say that we're part of a natural universe, right? This is Kant's, the starry heavens above. And they also know that I can't see very far, so because I only see seven stars and I know that I can't even see a guy who walks over the horizon, I probably think there are a whole bunch of other stars that I just can't see because my eye only goes that far. Would that be an irrational reason to believe in more stars even though I only see seven? Yes. It would be irrational, according to so, you. So, while you can come up with that as a justification, the reason that it seems like, I'm, talk, I'm talking within your analogy. Of within my analogy. Ever, we've only ever seen seven stars. That is not, so we have deductive reasoning. And then we have inferences, which is basically where science operates. And then there's abductive reasons. And abductive is going to be the weakest. And abductive is going to be arguing towards a, the best explanation. And in that case, we need candidate explanations. What you're talking about is, is an inference that seems intuitive, but has no evidence to actually support it. It does. The fact, the fact that I can only see so far should should guide my brain to say I should not be reaching conclusions about what is beyond my ability to see. Okay, so let's take, for example, you've seen a certain number of dogs in your life, correct? Yeah, tons of them. She okay. stops at every one. Right. Ab above and beyond that, you haven't seen other dogs that are outside the radius of your empirical experience, true? Correct. Y do you believe in that there are other dogs other than the ones you've seen? Uh, I have evidence of other dogs on Earth. If, it well, what was that evidence? I've seen video footage. I have okay, but, there, but let's just say the video footage, let's count those among the dogs you've seen. What about the dogs you haven't seen? Sure. You we believe they exist? On Earth, yes. But if you tell me that I should then, then believe that there are dogs on Saturn, that's the level of thing we're talking about. No, here. it's not. It's not. Absolutely not. See, this is the heart of the matter. This is the heart of the matter. Because according to you, religious people believe that there is a god who, like in ancient Greece, inhabits the natural world that's living on another planet and so your reasoning is at the level of the cosmonauts who go up into the sky and go, no God up here, 
therefore God doesn't exist. No, that's not it. Well, you just said that, that I'm proclaiming a dog on Saturn. Yes. And I'm saying I'm not, that's not what I'm doing at all. So if I, I can only see seven stars, there is a weak inference that there may be more stars, but to believe there actually are more stars isn't yet justified by the evidence. The dog example on Earth, even though I have not experienced every dog, I can actually do pretty much a rough estimate of dog by searching through data on how much dog food we sell, how many people buy Kong things, Things for their dogs, how many pets or us are scattered around the world. There's all sorts of data that get to this thing where now it is a strong inference that there is a dog in China that I have never met and will never meet. Do I believe that that's the case? Yes, because that's where the data point to. To, to go beyond what the data show, okay. to say that just because I've, I, I know that I have a limit to my vision and I can see seven stars, therefore I believe there are more, that is to go beyond what the data presents. You could, though, invent a telescope and improve your vision and get new data, which is exactly what we did to discover that we don't just live in the one and only galaxy and that the Earth isn't the center of the universe. Once we got that data, we began to have a better understanding of it. There are things, like the Higgs boson, for example, which are a part of theoretical physics that we didn't have physical, empirical evidence for, but that the math pointed to. I'm not in any way denying that math is good data, which is one of the reasons why, well, all right, I won't go there yet because we're still on Well, I mean, here we are on common ground. If you're talking about science, if you're talking about quantum physics, if you're talking about relativity, if you're talking about the Big Bang, if you're talking about evolution, we have nothing to argue about. I'm on board with you 100%. Hang on, you included science in that. Science, yes. I'm on board that with... that include climate change science? Uh, climate change is... At least in the, in the public sense, it's understood in no way science. 